Well, it's really my pleasure to uh, have a chance to introduce this panel, both to a studio audience. By the way, we have a studio audience. We have almost a full house tonight. So if you're not here tonight, right, you're watching this from your home in Longmont, you're going to miss really a fun time <laughs> in this studio. So the studio audience has been invited to listen to this conversation, and they, if they have questions before the, the evening runs out, before the hour runs out, about 40 minutes into the hour, we'll see how this conversation goes. And if there's time, we're going to ask audience members to come right, stand right over there by Eric, our camera guy. And, uh, and if you have a question, you'll get to ask it, and we'll get a chance to hear the response from this group. So pay attention, audience members. You're going to be part of the conversation before we finish. Around the table, Jason Valery is a product of the I Have a Dream program and lots of other experiences in life. But part of the reason uh, Jason and Jackie Juarez, who are at this end of the table, are here is I had the, I was, had the good fortune of listening to their stories at, I have, a, at a, I, I have a Dream Foundation luncheon last spring. And I was bowled over by what I heard and both their experiences in the program and what they're doing with their lives. So I'm excited to share your story with this audience and with this community. A lot of folks in town know, but if they didn't, they're going to learn pretty soon. Jenny Diaz-Leon uh, is not a stranger to this, uh, to the backstory. Jenny has, has been, I, I tried to promote her a little bit ago, and I was going to introduce her as a, as a program manager, but she's a coordinator for the city of Longmont in our uh, uh, division of, ch of children, youth, and families. And she's the manager of this project, right? Among the portfolio of other things she's managing, brings a, a tremendous amount to the city, and I know it's going to bring a lot to this program. And to my left is Dr. Perla Delgado. Dr. Delgado is the executive director slash president, I've referred to her, I've given her a number of titles as we've gone through this, of the I Have a Dream Foundation, Boulder County? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, Dr. Delgado has been in and around education and doing this kind of work for a long time. And, uh, and we're really excited about what's happening now this fall in Longmont. So, Dr. Delgado, I'm going to get started with you in this interview. Is it okay going forward that we call one another by our first names? Of course. Okay, definitely. Perla. <laughs> there's a, there's a storyline that starts way back from 1987, right? Correct. So if you, wherever you want to pick it up, this started in 1987 with Eugene Lang stepping into that classroom yeah. in Harlem, and, Harlem and, and the world changed in really profound ways uh, as a result. Get us started of course. with this storyline. So Eugene Lang attends actually his alma mater, his middle school, in 1987. And in the early 80s, I apologize. And uh, he was asked to inspire youth in the community. And how did he get to where he was? And how can they get there, right? And so the story goes that Eugene Lang looked around uh, the auditorium and he said, oh my gosh, like that for me, my journey was somewhat easy. It might not be as easy for the students that I'm about to talk to. So apparently he rips up his talking points and he offers full ride scholarships to students who are graduating um, from middle school going on to, um, sorry, sixth grade going on to seventh grade. And he promised them that upon graduation from high school, they would have a full ride scholarship. What he realized through this journey was that it wasn't simply giving them the money, but it was um, trying to remove as many barriers as possible. So fast forward to Boulder County, in the late 80s, early 90s, um, community leaders and local philanthropists come together after a 60-minute interview in 1987 with Eugene Lang, and they get inspired. And they say, how can we change, how can we impact the graduation rates in our communities? At the time, it was 37% of youth of color in Boulder County were graduating from either school district. And as we know, that's pretty dismal. So the community, lead, community leaders came together and said, we're going to form the I Have a Dream Foundation. So we've been around uh, the community uh, for almost 33 years now, making a difference and collaborating with youth and their families on this journey, on this pathway to post-secondary education. And I'll talk a little bit more about it later because I know we have some amazing panelists yeah. who will speak uh, firsthand of the work that we do in collaboration with students and families. Any more you want to do with vision and mission? Of course. Right now? Yeah, one, yeah, yeah, definitely. So our mission at I Have a Dream Boulder County is to collaborate with youth and their families 
as they successfully navigate this journey of education. We work with them collaboratively, and upon graduation, we offer a scholarship to each of our students. And it's an, a scholarship that can be used for any post-secondary pathway, whether it's a short-term degree or a certificate, two-year or four-year. And we work collaboratively with them to ensure that they have the tools, uh, the extra tools in their toolbox, as I like to say, to build, continue building this pathway to post-secondary education. And our vision is to impact each of the students and their families that we work with. And ultimately, our global vision is that every child has equitable opportunities to access educational resources and systems that really meet students where they're at. And so we're super excited that we've been around for 33 years, working collaboratively with over 2,200 families. Wow. Is this, this is the first time, however, you've partnered with with the city of Longmont correct as an institution have correct. you partnered with other municipalities uh, we partner with Boulder Housing Partners um, we do get funding from our municipalities our local municipalities but this is the first time that we're partnering with the city to launch a class of 45 first graders we're super excited yeah. um, and again you'll learn more as you get to hear from our other guests on the panel the city I, I'm pretty certain is in the process of thinking hard now about budget priorities mm -hmm. for 2024. Anything you'd like them to hear from you <laughs> as, the, as they're contemplating budget yeah. priorities? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, as we come together, as we look at the impacts of the pandemic yeah. and how it, it exasperated a lot of gaps that were already in place, and what it also taught us is that we can't do this alone. Um, the city, the district, nonprofits like I Have a Dream, community members, we all need each other to ensure that this pathway is a lot easier. It's not a guaranteed for all of us, right? But the pathway can be easier if we work collectively together. And I think there is this uh, responsibility that cities and the district have in ensuring that we're collaborating with community members like the volunteers, their board members, our students and their families, as well as nonprofits like the I Have a Dream Foundation. Um, and I really believe that if we work collaboratively, we can start to close the achievement gaps. We can increase graduation rates. We can fracture, if not eliminate, the cycle of poverty for many families that are experiencing that in Boulder County. Often, at times, it's invisible, but we see it as nonprofits. We see it as community members. But we can also address it if we come together. So um, before we, I'm going I'm to pivot to these two. Yeah. And, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll introduce you by title. I know I haven't done that, but I want to do that <laughs> in the context of your stories. Um, go back to, the, to tools, right? Yeah. That's a generic reference to all kinds of possibilities. Exactly. What are some of the tools that, that as you think about a new co cohort of kids mm -hmm. coming on board, getting started in the fall, what are the kinds of tools that, that you imagine will be in their toolbox as they, of course. as they go through their experience? Yeah, definitely. I also want to just preface this with our students and families come with many tools. They have skills and expertise. We're meeting students and families where they're at with these additional tools. And the additional tools is knowing how to navigate our school systems. It's social and emotional and learning um, uh, tools and interventions and strategies to help address some of the moments of crises that yeah. our students experience. It's providing additional academic support in the out-of-school time. It's also providing additional mentors and leaders from the community who work in collaboration with the students and their families. So, Go ahead. No, 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 you keep going. <laughs> to address any questions or concerns that they might have. Um, again, because we want to recognize the value that our families bring to these spaces. We just meet them where they're at and we say, okay, how can we work collaboratively? What's missing? What do you need more information on? And I think this collaboration with the city of Longmont and specifically the Longmont Youth Center is a great partnership because they already have that in place. Well, we have a model that we've been working on for 33 years, the city of Longmont and the youth center have worked in the community. So I think bringing our forces together will really help meet the families where they're at and help them grow academically, socially, and emotionally. Well, I think it's gonna bring a, a lot to, to, the, to the city in our division of children, youth, mm -hmm. and families, but the reciprocal is gonna be very exciting to see. And I, just to make the point, you made it clear that kids bring and their families bring yes. lots of tools. Correct. Sometimes it's refining the use, it's just recognizing that these are tools exactly. you know, that can be used yeah. and just some guidance on how to use them really well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. In addition to new tools. Yeah. So some of those tools came to, into your lives, right? Um, 
both that you brought to it and that you uh, acquired along the way. So Jackie Juarez, for those who don't know, is a specialist, is the diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist for the LEED School of Business at the University of Colorado, right? Um, that, those are a lot of words. That's a high-powered <laughs> cool. position, right? Jason is uh, the, the director of a product management team, global team, for Microsoft. So you're managing folks who are doing software development around the world, yeah. right? So flip a coin. Who wants to start this? <laughs> um, you both have powerful stories. You've told them before. You've tag-teamed this. Um, somebody, either one of you, just jump in and, and pick. Can jump in. So... My journey dates back to Columbine Elementary. So for folks that- Did you say Columbine Elementary? Columbine Elementary, yeah. down Columbine the road. Elementary. Listen to this. Yes, yes. Yeah. Columbine Elementary back in 2002. So back then, the I Have a Dream Foundation um, focused on the model of one donor for 50 students. Um, and we were very lucky to have Kathy Ray, um, who was our class sponsor, and she, um, invested a million dollars into a group of 50 students and throughout Columbine Elementary I remember the after school programming that was something I looked forward to every single time um, because not only did we get academic support but you talk about the experiential education the camping opportunities things that maybe in my household at the time we weren't exposed to or maybe we didn't have the resources and the I Have a Dream Foundation supplied that for me to get that opportunity. So after fifth grade, I, my class sponsor, Kathy Ray, sponsored me to attend a private K-12 school in the area and I graduated and went to the University of Denver where I pursued my um, bachelor's in business administration and I loved all things about business, international aspects, the cultures that um, contribute to our day-to-day -day dynamics and relationships. Those are very much at the core of who I am. And in my undergrad years, I actually started teaching part-time in Denver Public Schools, a social justice curriculum. And it was then, you can imagine, first year undergrad teaching part-time to high school students. I wasn't, you know, I was in high school not too long ago and I was here in this classroom, but I always remember the one student that's for me in education and it took that one student in the classroom who was too cool for school, <laughs> would not want to engage in our curriculum, for me to understand that it wasn't that this student did, want, did not want to engage, they were dealing with things from home, and that didn't allow them to be fully present here. And when we were able to work on that relationship and understand me as, as the adult in the room, the instructor, what can I support this student? They're already so gifted, and they needed that emotional support and that understanding that really shifted my passion of how to mix business with education and that ultimately started out my career in education and uh, after the University of Denver I worked in Denver Public Schools with community engagement um, with some of our charter schools and I returned back as a world language instructor for the uh, K-12 institution that I went to and I was doing diversity equity and inclusion work at that time then COVID hit and I said, what a better time to uh, get another degree under my belt. <laughs> and um, That's what everybody said, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the neat thing is, is that it was an online program, so it fit my <laughs> working need, right? <laughs> um, and graduated from University of Colorado Boulder with my master's in organizational leadership. And that led me to my current position here. Um, I'd be remiss, of course, not to mention that um, we're on the board. So I've been with the I Have a Dream Foundation serving as a board uh, member for the last four years. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is always giving back. That has been one of the values that my family has instilled in me is always give back to the people that supported you. And for me, I mean, I'm a product of this organization and I know that we cannot get things done just as by understanding the importance of community and gifted and nurtured and supported through this program. I believe that I have that duty to also share that with the rest of our students in this case. I think you probably used the word gifted in two ways. You are gifted. <laughs> <laughs> and you received uh, the gift of this mm. kind of investment and mm. somebody embracing mm. you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have twice mentioned, or yeah. several times mentioned mm. the schools you went to, an unnamed 
uh, K-12 yeah. school, it's okay. <laughs> you can name the school if you want to. Yeah, of course. So um, it's Alexander Dawson School. So it's a K-12 yeah. private school down the road on 287. Yeah, I would say there's a lot of people who deserve credit. Yeah, right, yes. For of course. the woman that emerged here. Yes. And uh, Columbine Elementary, mm -hmm. which we're going to champion, is That's one of right. those. And, and I think my wife was teaching at Columbine in 2002. <laughs> Janie's in the audience right now, so I'm a, she can take some credit for this, even though I don't think she had you as a student. But I know there were great teachers. They'll remember their names, yep. Tim. Uh, and, they still, and they still show up every day. Good, right? yeah. Uh, and then that somebody would see in you all that, all that promise mm -hmm. and, um, and give you a chance to experience what you experienced yes. at, at Dawson um, is another part of that story and the, and the gift. Yes. But, 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 but there's a lot of work behind that, mm -hmm. that storyline. Mm -hmm. So good on you. We're going to come back to all this. Awesome. Jason, pick it up from there. Yeah, so my uh, experience with the I Have a Dream Foundation started when I was uh, at Pioneer Elementary School. I think it was probably 1990 when uh, the organization launched uh, a class there. And uh, I uh, was uh, fortunate enough to become part of that Dreamer Scholar class. Uh, my personal circumstances at the time were um, a little unstable. Um, shortly after that, my parents got divorced and my mom and I moved to Longmont when I was nine. And uh, you know that class that I have dreamed class that was based there in Lafayette uh, continued to you know operate as a, a class together and have all of the benefits that the I have a Dream Foundation brings in that tight knit environment. But I was a remote member, um, and one of the things that I really think back uh, about and the benefits I got from the organization was that sort of uh, continuity. Even though I wasn't locally near them, I, I was moving around. But, you know, my mom, you know, she struggled, and we, we lived all over this community. And I switched schools, I moved from uh, a number of different elementary schools, middle schools, and throughout that entire journey that I had from an educational perspective, I had one consistent thing in that, and that was the Iowa Dream Foundation. Um, my program director uh, at the time would drive uh, all the way up to Longmont, pick me up and take me to a meeting in Lafayette after school, uh, or Boulder at, at one point. And that sort of consistent adult role model in my life from very early age all the way through when I graduated from Longmont High in 2000, um, I think was a huge part of my education success. Just somebody who kept me accountable to what I was uh, you know, committing to myself, to my educational journey, somebody who provided that mentorship, that just stable adult role model, um, was the tool that I took from the I Have a Dream Foundation into my success. Uh, who was it that said never, never Feel to remember that one or two people, yeah, right, can change the world. Yeah, was my not my quote. <laughs> yeah, I just screwed it up. But, but this is an example. When yeah. when people say, "What can I do?" You know, what can one person do? Just That's think it. about this story yeah. and how what one the impact one person made in your life, in your life. Mm -hmm. Now talk about what you're doing. Yeah, well, I mean, so, so when, I, when I was a kid, I was, I was a computer nerd. I was the stereotypical computer nerd, really into to computers. And, you know, I will also add one of the benefits I really got from the organization was the opportunity to pursue my passions in a certain extent, like getting access to internship programs and so forth. And so, you know, when I graduated high school, I very quickly uh, went into the software industry. And so I uh, was a software developer for a number of years and moved through software development uh, into then product management. And where I find myself today is I've been at Microsoft for, I actually just celebrated my 10-year anniversary with Microsoft. Uh, and I'm a director of product management. So I'm responsible for, as you said, a large global team. Uh, we deliver a core part of our storage platform, our storage cloud platform. Uh, and it's been just an incredibly rewarding career that I've been able to have as a result of, you know, having that accountability young and keeping me focused on the things that uh, that mattered I, you know i think the this the saying that i often hear is like, if you do, if you love what you do you'll never work a day yeah. in your life and that's really what happened for me early on is i was i took my passion and was able to take it into a career and that career has carried me to where i am today uh, i'm going to come back to both of you say a little bit more jackie about your what you do with your days now right yeah. i think that's an important part of the story as well yeah so as uh, i'm going to shorten it di culture specialist for the business school i work with our business staff and understanding the culture um, there's a lot of strategic um, analytics looking at the data what does the trends in years past tell us to improve the culture um, recruitment retention for our staff and uh, for our students of color. So 
there's that component, but also that strategic planning. What will diversity, equity, and inclusion look like in business in the next five years? Um, how do we make sure that we are also aligned with the greater campus and the system views? Um, and at the core of it, how do we ensure that our employees feel a sense of belonging? Um, and oftentimes I think about, I'm an empath and, and that's, that's who I am. And for me, I strive to ensure that whatever walk of life any of our employees come in, that they feel like they are heard, seen, and valued for the gifts and talents that they bring to our business school. So that, in short, is, is how I support our, our employees. I wonder if we took a show of hands for those people who went through university experiences, mm. how many would raise their hands and say, yeah, that's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the university went and I was seen, heard, and valued. Mm -hmm. Or are you just kind of on your own? Mm -hmm. So the fact that, that that's the work you're doing is such a powerful statement and ex an extension of what you experienced yourself. Um, I know this is probably not a fair question, uh, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, none of us, right, when you, in, retros in a retrospective, right, we reflect on our lives. Uh, none of us can predict where we would be if it weren't for fill in the blank, this person, that person, this opportunity because um, we're all a product of what those doors that opened and the people who touched our lives. But, but are you willing to speculate? Without the I Have a Dream Foundation, how likely is it you would be doing what you're doing today? I mean, you're both yeah. bright and talented, and I'm not taking that away <laughs> from your natural gifts. Yeah, there's a lot of things that factor into our success. But, um, you know, I think about um, my parents, you know, and, and my mom, and I think about, you know, what she went through to provide for me. Uh, you know, she didn't have that opportunity to do what she loved. She had to provide. And so her life was not in a, in a career that was fulfilling in any meaningful way. She cleaned houses and worked at gas stations and did random jobs through her, full, her life. And that was out of necessity, uh, necessity to survive. And you know, I really appreciate that the opportunities the I Have a Dream Foundation gave me allowed me to really focus on my passion. Because if you can turn a passion into a career, you have the just continual ability to continue to work up and to continue to find new ways to drive impact uh, through what you do on a daily basis. And, and I would speculate maybe that I would have had to follow the path my mom took in many working uh, moms and, and other uh, parents have to take to make ends meet. And yeah. they have to take jobs that pay the bills, not the ones that reward them and provide them opportunities to have the impact that I've Inspire had. Inspire the soul yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the imagination as yeah. opposed to just put food on the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, similar to Jason, for me, I, and I often think about that. Every time there's a, a huge milestone in my life and I have a dream has been a part of that, I often think, what would my life be without I have Dream Foundation. And in my moments of reflection, I think about the, the doors and connections that the foundation has supported me with. Um, talking about education to traveling. Um, I mean, the fact that I was able to travel abroad in, in high school, that was something that my siblings and opportunities that they were not presented with and just learning about the world and, and, and ways that we work. So for me, I think about that I'm very grateful and um, I always give credit where it's due with this organization because it really opened many doors and connections, not only personally, but professionally. I think about, um, I am an extroverted and I love networking with people and a lot of my connections here, I mean, Tim, it has also been because of the foundation. Um, and so that's, that's what, I, what comes to mind. Uh, we've all heard people say things like, no, I stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's true for probably anybody who's successful in life, mm -hmm. that you're standing on the shoulders of those who came before you. In this case, you can name those people mm -hmm. and, and the shoulders that they gave you a chance to stand on when you were very young, mm -hmm. right? So when I think about when people watch this and they think about what can I do, right, right here in Longmont to make a difference, mm -hmm. this is a great example mm -hmm. of, of without a whole lot of a preparation. I'm certain that there's some preparation, <laughs> things, but that, but it's, it's people bring their heart and their yeah. and their willingness to extend themselves mm -hmm. and what an impact they can have. Yeah. And you're going to have a chance to make more of this happen, lady. That's uh, <laughs> so smile if you're happy about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Jenny, talk about this. Uh, you do so many great things for the city, and and you know we could go on and on about all that you do. And uh, for folks who have have followed you, they know you are you know on the rise. Uh, as a contributor to the city of Longmont and 
in 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 the city government and in the city of Longmont, even though you live somewhere else, and, and that's okay. And I grew up here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, you know, it's it's always fun to have you back here and, and see what you do day in and day out. But just talk about. Where, what, what's the role? What's the city's role? How is this going to come together? What should people know yes. as this unfolds? So the very first thing that I think is important to talk about is when these conversations were started about our partnership, um, what I really started envisioning is how we would work together to fill the gaps that you talked about um, that got even bigger with COVID. And for the city of Longmont, we do great programming with, um, with our community and, and really I think everybody that works here, we're all community connectors. We're all cultural brokers that are able to build those relationships and to have a program like I Have a Dream that also values the community members, the strengths that everybody brings, it seemed like such a natural fit, um, which I'm really excited about working with everybody around the table and, and the rest of the teams. Um, there's a lot that goes into something like this, right? And I think one of the pieces I mentioned before is, is funding, and that is a very big piece. I think that um, when I think about programs like this, uh, you often hear that youth are the future. Youth are the future, and the truth is that youth are the now, mm. right? And every time that we invest as a city and as a community in the future of these of children in our community, we are kind of watering a little seed to be able to blossom to the future, right? But it's, it starts now. Um, and so fundraising is definitely a piece of that. Um, we have meetings where we connect with each other to be able to, to move this process along. Uh, one of the things that we are actually in the works of uh, in these next two weeks is uh, doing some interviews for a, a program manager for this next cohort of students. Um, and then after they are selected, we'll be working closely with them to be able to determine the students, um, reaching out to different community members so that they know about how they can get involved uh, in the different levels of, um, whether it's service or uh, volunteering is a big piece of that. Um, and, and even spreading the word. I think as a cultural broker, that's one of the best ways and one of the most simplest ways to be able to support a community program is is talking to your neighbor about it or, hey did you hear that this is happening in town did you hear that um, this is the first time that this is happening with uh, directly a city uh, and we have an opportunity to create change for our youth here um, and then after uh, that there there will also be a hiring process for a program specialist uh, who will also be supporting this cohort we are hoping this summer to once we have the the children uh, selected to be able to do a lot of community building because as you heard from a lot of these people here is that community is is the center it's the core of this and it's i think it's what makes it successful is that the people that go through this program know that they have a community behind them and when you feel that you you feel like you can soar yeah um, and so that's the very first piece is building community within that that cohort um, and you think about the students too, but you think about the parents as well. The, the thing that I really appreciate about um, I Have a Dream as well is that they are looking at that parent support and that's something that we will be able to work together with because the, the Longmont Youth Center also has parenting programs to support the families and, and we'll be able to partner in different ways to leverage the resources that we have to better serve the community. So um, that's a piece of things. Uh, I think the the we're hoping to do, like I said, that soft lunch in the summer, and then by September, the program will be already up and running. Um, you said it was 45 students, mm -hmm. uh, first graders in our community, and I think uh, one of the things that uh, that is exciting to me too is that it's this year, and then we're we're going to be having multiple classes throughout the year. So we're going to um, start one class this year, take a year to help that <coughs> class develop and then get another class started. So it's gonna be a great community change. And I just think about, you know, the stories that you've shared of growing up. And I think about my story too being, I, I grew up here in Longmont. I'm an immigrant from Durango, Mexico. And just hearing the message from my parents of, you have to go to college or you have to go to post-secondary education, but not really knowing how you're gonna get there. This, you have people helping guide that experience. Um, and so it's gonna be very valuable. 
I, I should do a pitch right now for the 529 Jump Program. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then make certain that all the parents of the kids involved in this program are, are working with us to open those accounts because that's another yeah. part of the message that we want to we want to send. Um, so somebody who's listening right now and think mm -hmm. and, and or listens after tonight and it sparks an interest, who do they contact and what might they be expected or asked to do? Yeah, so uh, depending on the level of involvement, there there's going to be different asks, right? So especially with when working with youth, um, if you're wanting wanting to volunteer, there's going to be um, different mentor roles that that they will be able to volunteer to support a youth or a group, a small group of youth uh, throughout this process. Um, they will have to go through uh, like a background check and, and different trainings because we want to make sure that um, the volunteers that are coming into this program are able to see the youth from the lens, um, that strength-based lens that we uh, we want to make sure that, that everybody sees the youth with because they do come with mm -hmm. so many gifts and talents. Um, and uh, if, if people are wanting to get involved by, by helping us fundraise, uh, there's, there's different uh, opportunities that will be available with that. Uh, but anybody that is interested right now, I ask that you uh, send an email or come to the Longmont Youth Center and I'd love to sit down with uh, each and every one of you and, and share the different opportunities, get you involved, um, because it, it takes a village. It really does. Well, it sounds like <clears throat> the, the idea of being seen, heard, and valued, uh, if, it's, if it's useful at the university, mm -hmm. it's critical <laughs> at, as first graders. Yes. And that's part of what this experience is going to be about. So you mentioned email. Mm -hmm. uh, what would the email, what email address would you want people to yes. use? So my email address, it's a very long one, so make sure <laughs> you ha might have to rewind and watch it again. But my email address is jennifer, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R dot D-I-A-Z hyphen L-E-O-N at longmontcolorado.gov. Uh, and my phone number, which is a little bit shorter, is 303-774-3754. All right. Well, that's we're making we're making progress. Now I'm going to suggest that uh, members of the audience, if they have questions, if somebody want, has one and want to come over here, um, we'll be. I'm going to. I'll call on you in just a moment. Um, and we have some movement in the audience. I think Jason's <laughs> daughters might be exiting. Right? They may, may have had they may have had all the all the fun they want to have here. Um, uh, <clears throat> program's going to start in the fall. It's the first of what we we hope to see. Mm -hmm. Uh, cohort after cohort, yes. right? So starting with first graders, and the, is there a, is the intent that we're going to see for a long term the I Have a Dream program working with the city, bringing kids together from across the community or a particular school? How's that going to work? So we're hoping the the first year we're hoping to focus on one school to make sure that that. Um, we're very intentional about mm -hmm. launching this program and, and making sure that they get the, the attention needed. Um, and then, like I said, there's going to be a kind of a gap. So this first year, uh, the, really the first two years will be focused on that class. And then by the, th the time that the first class is at their third year, uh, there will be another launch to another class. Okay. So... Uh, I'm gonna make certain we haven't I haven't missed any of my questions. Can I also add something oh, absolutely. that um, I think has really been mentioned here, right? And that's the piece of when the I Have a Dream started, it primarily focused on youth and what we call dreamer scholars. Um, what we've done these past couple of years is incorporate a two-generational approach. So we're working with the entire family unit. Um, we're meeting uh, families where they're at, as I've mentioned before, but we're also meeting their adult parents, guardians, or caregivers. Um, we're meeting with them, getting to know their aspirations, the challenges that they're facing, and really encouraging and working collaboratively with them to complete their GED or high school diploma, enter a post-secondary pathway, whether it's a certificate program, a two-year program, or a four-year program. We currently have over 40 adult learners from our Dreamer Scholar community in a post-secondary pathway, either again completing a GED or a short-term or long-term degree. We also added a component because what we've learned through this partnership and this relationship with parents is that 
the parents need a little bit more support if they if English is not their first language. Mm -hmm. And so about 64% of our Dreamer scholars are classified through both districts as English language learners. So we're meeting parents where they're at, encouraging them to enroll in our ESL classes. It's a collaboration with Front Range Community College and getting them that confidence and that encouragement and those connections as has been mentioned before um, to really just make a difference because we know that if we can begin to move the needle forward with the parents and the adults and the lives of Dreamer Scholars and, and others, we can move the needle forward in fracturing and or eliminating the cycle of poverty. Yeah. So we're trying to move it a little bit faster. <laughs> so all the, all the adults you just referred to yeah. are all parents yes. or guardians of dreamers, Correct. they're they're part of the, they're the part of the family unit. Yes. So it's not it's not a different program no. specifically for uh, adult dreamers. <laughs> it is a, it is family dreamers. Correct. Right? So it's the parents, the but we also have uh, an additional uh, component to our program that we've expanded is working with adult dreamers who, for whatever reason, weren't able to finish their GED or high school diploma. Who were in the program who were and haven't had quite the results exactly. that these two have For many reasons, right? So we are trying to bring back our alums who weren't able to finish, and then we're working with their parent community and the guardian community to um, support them in accomplishing their goals and aspirations. I know um, this, is, this is a bit of a tangent, and I didn't prepare you for this kind of a question. <laughs> and and I, it may not be fair, uh, and I don't, want, uh, I don't want to overdo this, and I don't want to you know, redirect this, but I, I find myself in conversations frequently in this community uh, about <clears throat> what we should be doing um, about uh, events, behaviors, mm -hmm. situations that occur that, that we have a lot of anxiety about, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and uh, we, we spend a lot of time and effort trying to intervene mm -hmm. after problems have occurred, whether they're with kids, young adults, or adults, right? Um, you want to talk about what this means in terms of getting in front of that? Uh, how important affiliation is, a sense of belonging, one of Maslow's, yep. you know, level four of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, where, where without these opportunities, kids get drawn other places, right, because of that need. Uh, what should people know, of, if, if you really care about getting in front of some of the dysfunction we see, what does this represent as a way to keep that from happening? So what we know, right, the research tells us as early as kindergarten, we know based on attendance, based on reading, based on engagement, which students are going to be successful. We know which students, statistically, right, are going to make it to high school graduation. And if we know that information, if we've been talking about it, then why can't we do something earlier, yeah. right? Why can't we begin to remove those barriers for engagement, help create systems that um, really encourage students to be seen and heard, meet students where they're at, families where they're at. If we know all of the research, and it's research-based, you can just Google it, <laughs> and you can find research that supports that. If we know that that's happening, and those are the stories that we're able to, to tell as early as kindergarten, then we should be focusing on early childhood education. We should be talking to families as early as first grade and saying, what are some of the gifts that your students have at home that you see, and what are some of the challenges? Because again, teachers, what we know through the pandemic, right, the first year, teachers were hit really hard, and they work extremely, I mean, they just work so hard to meet students, to support students, and what we also learned was they couldn't do it alone. I mean, we had families who didn't know how to navigate computers, yeah. who didn't know how to navigate all of those applications, and we activated these parent pods to basically encourage parents to learn computers, to learn computer literacy, to embark on these classes, because we knew that was a barrier, and we knew that teachers couldn't do it alone. And so working with and in collaboration with the school system, I think is critical to addressing some of those gaps that they can't they can't take on. Unfortunately, our school systems can't do everything yeah. for all the families. But 
We have community members right. who can be volunteers. We have local municipalities who invest in this type of work. We have nonprofits that have an expertise. So if we begin to complement the work that's happening for students, we're able to get them on this path. And I think also recognizing that there are different means of success, right? Um, a four-year pathway can be a success for a student, but so can a short-term degree. So can someone who works in HVAC or is an electrician. That too is success. And we knew we needed all of those expertise <laughs> during the pandemic, right? Everybody was at home, so the plumbing system, right, was definitely <laughs> in need of experts. And so I think that's part of, again, this journey. I don't know if my panelists want to add something else. <laughs> yeah, I can. Go, Go ahead. ahead. Go you. Ahead. One of, the, one of the things that came up for me too is I always think about how are we engaging community voices in the places where decisions are being made. And one of the neat things that um, as board members we have experienced is also the representation of a parent board member. So really bridging those connections between all of our stakeholders so that there's information transparency but there's also that level of engagement from within our families mm -hmm. so that they know What's the board doing? What's the organization doing with something that my child will be invested in for all of these years? So I just wanted to make sure that that was also um, highlighted. Thank you. Yes. Uh, what I was going to say is that when you think about, I think this is one of the reasons why we're such a great fit as organizations, is that when you think about uh, youth protective factors, mm -hmm. when, a, when a, a, ch a child is learning how to effectively manage their emotions and learn how to communicate in a positive way when they're learning about their identity and their culture and they're proud of that they they learn those mm -hmm. gifts that that they have and and those are identified at a young age mm -hmm. you are setting that child up for success mm -hmm. um, my my co-worker uh, Louis Lopez is very well known in the community he always says if you know where you come from mm -hmm. you know where you're going Right, and so if you're you're developing a strong character and a strong identity at such a young age, that's only going to flourish, right? That's only going to that's only going to grow into a more positive um, view for that person, and then they'll be able to see that these doors are open. Because if you don't have that strong core mm -hmm. within yourself, then if a door opens, you're not going to feel like you're capable of taking those opportunities. Uh, and that's what one of the things that I, I really think is going to be so valuable that we're going to do that. Um, and the other thing that I think about too is that we're going to be able to. Um, in some families, you might think, you know, well, you're only working with the with the first grader. Mm -hmm. This is going to be an opportunity for us to give resources to the family as a whole uh, with this partnership. So if they have a middle school student, they'll be able to participate in our after school and summer programming. Um, once so they, siblings. Yes, yeah. siblings. Um, we also have a post-secondary planning program, which I'm very excited to partner with you all on because we have uh, Aspire, which is focused on supporting first generation um, college or first generation high school students on their pathway to higher education. Uh, and so there's some pieces where we might overlap, but really this is going to be able to to see how we can support each other to to make that impact. Yeah, I I, I should have brought <clears throat> the vision statement that. The city of Longmont uh, the council has adopted, adopted in 2018, developed, reaffirmed just recently. Um, but part of that vision for, for people is that this would be a community in which children would be most fortunate to be born and raised. Mm -hmm. When somebody asks, what does that mean, right? You know, those are words on paper. This is what it means. It, it's not every, it doesn't solve every problem, <laughs> but it is a huge, it's a huge step, a huge contribution uh, to answering the question, what does this mean in communities like this? Uh, put that together with, you made reference to early childhood. There's, yeah. I'm gonna get a chance, to, I hope, <laughs> to do a backstory on uh, child care and early childhood education coming up pretty soon, but I'm waiting until a moment <laughs> to do that. Uh, but if you add them up, right, add yeah. those things up, and, and it's a, it's a first-rate school district, that what the city does in terms of outreach to community and families is pretty remarkable. But it all comes together in this constellation, right, mm -hmm. of, um, of folks leaning in together uh, to elevate, to, have, to, to make certain our kids are seen, heard, and valued. Mm -hmm. So are there questions I haven't asked you that you wished I had asked? Like, why didn't he, why didn't he ask me this? <laughs> I don't want to left anything unsaid, and I don't think. You have a question. Oh, we do have a question. Uh, I, it's been answered in the discussion. Oh, the question's been answered. <laughs> 
Oh, oh I think there's another question. <laughs> hey, Cheryl. Hi. <laughs> I, I recognize that voice. Uh, well done so far. I have enjoyed this. I'm curious as to what the, um, the cohort of first graders activities would look like in a given month or a given semester that makes it unique that they are I have a dream people versus just regular students. Great question. It is a great question. Thank you. <laughs> so um, our program model for the most part is the out of school time. So once the students have completed school, what we do in our program model is one, it's developed as a cohort. So we develop for, we recruit 45 students. And in the out of school time, we're going to, it's more structured. So there is a curriculum, there's a social justice curriculum, there's an academic curriculum, which will focus on both math and literacy, because we know that those are two indicators also for success. And we provide snacks, we provide experiential learning activities, oftentimes for a population that doesn't have those resources. Um, we know that many of our students also often go home to empty homes. If they can't afford after-school child care, if for whatever reason the school isn't offering after-school care programs that are affordable, our I Have a Dream model really encompasses uh, very many aspects of after-school care, so experiential learning, academic support, social and, emotion, social and emotional support, and to ensure that the students, again, are um, being exposed to different opportunities that they otherwise would not have. Um, and we build a pathway to a post-secondary education. So we focus a lot in the out-of-school time and bringing in panelists and volunteers, doing tours on campuses, learning about uh, colleges like the Emily Griffith School, coming in and really, again, doing hands-on. Oh, you want to be a chef? Oh, you want to be an artist? Here is what you can do. Here are the resources locally that will help you. Again, we're really unique in the sense that we're one of the few models that builds a relationship with the students. We're with them for anywhere between 10 to 13 years because of that cohort model. So we get to know the family the families really well. We're able to address food insecurity. We're able to address housing insecurity with collaboration with other nonprofits in the community. We don't do it all. <laughs> There's expertise across the county. And so we're because of those relationships that are fostered in our model, we're able to address and celebrate a lot of these achievements. Wonderful, what a great answer. Um, one other question, what kind of attrition is there in the cohorts? That is a great question. You have amazing questions. So our cohort model, again, is about 45 students with this new class. We've had cohorts in the past that are as large as 65 students. And we have about a 93% retention rate. Most of our students and families who don't remain in the program is, because I'm sure Tim has talked about it in the past, Boulder County is not affordable. Right. Um, and so it's because they moved, it's because mom and dad found another job in another community, but we very much still keep in contact with the Dreamer Scholars once they've moved. But sometimes life happens and they feel like we're not uh, the right model because what we do while well, we provide a lot of resources and supports for students, we also ask for that engagement back. So we add a component of community engagement and community leadership and volunteerism, and they're volunteering in the community, making a difference again, and really planting that seed of leadership for our youth. So I, it's a pretty high rate of retention, and it's really based on that relationship that they form with the program staff. Wonderful. Thank yeah? you. And I do want to just add another statistic. Uh, we had a 95% graduation rate in um, our Dreamer classes last year. Wow. And so um, that's, again, a statistic that is really important to share with everyone because we're doing this collaboratively. The school district is making a difference. We're making a difference. The city and other nonprofits are addressing these barriers that the students have and celebrating the successes and the gifts, as Jackie mentioned, that they bring to our communities. And together, Together we're able to create these students who say, I belong in Longma, I belong in Boulder County, and I can make a difference. I mean, to know that these experts, all three of them, still reside and do work in our community, yeah. we want to be able to not just grow that intellect that they bring, 
but also keep it here, right? Because we want them to contribute to the work that is happening. And I feel really proud to be part of this panel and to know that they're a product of these school systems and that they're still giving back. Uh, well, talk about being proud. <laughs> I I'm so proud that you all would be willing to take an evening or an hour out of your evening and donate it again, right, uh, to the community by spending your hour with me and sharing this story. Were there any other questions? Eric, all right. Any last words any of you want to share? I do just want to share. <laughs> as a nonprofit, I, I would be remiss if I don't plug in. The way that we survive as nonprofits in Boulder County is through donations. It's um, time, treasure, and talent, right? So if you can't donate, um, you can donate your intellect and expertise. And we're always looking for those individuals who want to work with youth, both at the Longmont Youth Center, through the Friends of the Longmont Youth Center, and I Have a Dream. So we're at IHaveADreamBoulder.org. The Longmont Youth Center you can find through the City of Longmont's website um, because that's how we can give back, right? It's really important for me to also share that uh, Boulder County is one of the wealthiest communities in the state of Colorado and yet we are the least giving. <laughs> and there, there's an interesting right dichotomy that happens. So I ask that if you don't have treasure to donate, but you have talent to give, mm -hmm. that's how we can really meet families and students where they're at and move us forward as a community. Yeah, I, I, you would like to say that over and over <laughs> and over again, just kind of amplify and reiterate and reiterate. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because that, is a, that, that, that part of this message has to get through, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And there's so many ways people can contribute exactly. to this. It doesn't have to just be through big checks. Exactly. Although that's good. It's always, yeah, it yeah, makes yeah. a difference. Generosity <laughs> takes a lot of different forms. Definitely. All right. Uh, you do remarkable things with your lives. So uh, in addition to thank you for this hour, thank you so much for what you do day in and day out. Uh, it's a great place to live because of people like you and uh, the, the, what you're willing to give back. So uh, I'm honored that you were here. And Longmonters, that is the backstory on the I Have a Dream program and its new cohort starting in Longmont in the fall of 2023.